Hi, everybody. I'm Melanie Hopkins. I'm a curator in the Department of Invertebrate Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about trilobites. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so, of course, I'm not the only scientist at the museum. There are a large group of us, and that also includes students. And we're very fortunate today to have one of those students, uh, Ernesto Vargas Parra. Hello. I'm Ernesto Vargas Parra, and I am a paleontologist and student at the Richard Gilder Graduate School at the museum. And I also study trilobites, looking at their 3D shape or 3D forms, looking at the little subunits of the head and how they interact. So today, we're going to take a tour through the museum's trilobite collections, or, or really just a small part of the collections, because there's a, there is a lot to look at. Um, and if you have any questions as you're watching, please post them in the comments and we'll answer them on screen as we all watch the video together. Well, uh, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, and we, I see there, there are already a few, but let me just introduce what we're looking at here. Um, this is one of the collection spaces in, on the fifth floor, which is above all of the exhibits at the museum. And uh, this space is both a collection space and an office space and a lab space. And right now there are a bunch of specimens that are laid out on tables, and we're also gonna look at some stuff in the cabinets. All right, and we already have one question from a car kid, and they asked, what are the closest living relatives of trilobites? And I think that's still up to debate, right, Melanie? Whether there's two? Yeah, yeah, so there's still a lot of research being done on what other types of arthropods trilobites are most closely related to. There are some studies that uh, have um, provided some evidence that they're probably more closely related to chalicerates, that's the group of arthropods that includes scorpions and spiders and horseshoe crabs. And there's some evidence that maybe they, they're actually, they were actually more closely related to um, uh, mandibulates, which includes things like crustaceans, shrimp, lobsters, and insects. But in terms of what trilobites were doing at any given time, like during the ocean while they were alive, Horseshoe crabs are a really, really good analogy. They're probably acting very similar to the way that modern horseshoe crabs act today. Ah, that's a great, uh, we just got a question about what trilobites eat. This is a great follow-up to the last question. So trilobites seem to be bottom feeders, right? They seem to like eat the, eat the stuff out on the seafloor, maybe like detritus is what we call it, but kind of like organic little stuff? Yeah, they were probably mostly scavengers and deposit feeders. So they could have eaten a lot of different things, plant material, animal material, but it's unlikely, but most of them were probably scavenging that, and uh, very few, if any, were actually active predators. And it's also hypothesized that maybe they were like um, carnivores that they ate like I see a lot of pictures of trilobites eating worms <laughs> as like little drawings. <laughs> Do you think that has like, is that valid? Um, yes, I, they certainly could have eaten that kind of material. Um, and, and, so, and probably would have if they'd come across it on the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. So we, we just got a question that asked, um, what was the trilobite's worst enemy during the Cambrian period? And I think classically, like I've seen cartoons of this, of like an anomala, uh, anomalocaris chasing a trilobite around. An anomalocaris is this huge, it's huge for the Cambrian, but it's like the size of a dinner plate that would float around and has these two little mouth pieces, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they act as mouth, uh, specialized mouth parts. Oh, we just got a question about uh, the largest and the smallest trilobites. So 
there was a really large uh, range in body size, actually. The smallest trilobites were only a few millimeters, less than a centimeter long. Um, but the largest trilobite that's ever been found was 72 centimeters. That's over two feet. <laughs> so there is this huge range. Um, but I would say on average, most trilobites were around two to three inches long. I think the largest one, it was, it's called Isotelus rex, right? So it's like, yeah. it's like the trilobite, it's not the T-rex, but it's like the I-rex of trilobites. Yeah, right, right, like the king, <laughs> the king trilobite, yeah. Right. Hmm. Someone asked about trilobite mating. Um, I study a lot about um, some trilobite reproduction looking at the babies, but specific mating patterns, do you know, Melanie? We have found some clusters of trilobites that could possibly represent trilobites acting at, actually acting in a gregarious fashion, like coming together as groups, the way horseshoe crabs do when it's time to mate. Um, but we don't know a whole lot about that behavior because that type of behavior is something that we, we learn about by observing animals. Um, and there are some traces in the, in the rock record that represent behavior, but mating is not usually one of them that we can infer directly at least. Um, that said, we do have some evidence for trilobite eggs. And we have a lot of information from trilobite fossils about how they grew and changed during development. Mm -hmm. So we just got a question about um, the fossil part of the trilobite that we usually find in the record, and is it part of the body itself, or is it the exoskeleton that the trilobite has shed? So for that part, most trilobite fossils that we find are just parts of the head or the tail or the thorax, and that usually means that that was the trilobite molt. But rarely, when you find the whole trilobite, uh, basically all together, all the pieces together, you could say that's kind of like the carcass of the animal. It was probably like, buried very fast and it preserved that way. So does that answer that question, I think? I think so. Um, but yes, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, another way of basically just saying what Ernesto said was uh, most of the trilobite fossil record is made up of, the ex of shed exoskeletons. Um, but occasionally, we, there are fossils that we think was the, represents the trilobite when it died. And even more rarely, but uh, even more rarely, but it is possible to actually get some soft body preservation, including traces of the digestive system and appendages um, and uh, yeah, those are the two main parts when we get some soft body preservation. <laughs> Ooh, we just got a question about trilobite eyes and what, what we could say about their eyes and specifically their vision. So trilobite eyes are made out of calcite. So calcite is a mineral that's kind of weird, has like a double refraction. I actually don't know much about trilobite eyes, but Melanie, how did trilobite eyes, how did they see? Um, yes, well, you're right. They, they had um, lenses that were made of calcite. Um, and um, they, most trilobites have an arrangement of lenses that's very similar to a compound eye, like you see an insect. Um, okay, there is one group of trilobites that had um, uh, very large lenses that were separated by what looks to be like some sort of cuticle or membrane. Um, but the entire surface of the eye, um, uh, well, all of these lenses are arranged um, and uh, across a sort of curved surface. And the entire surface of that eye can give us some information about um, how much each trilobite could see around it. Um, and this is actually a really, really useful piece of information sometimes for inferring life habits of trilobites. There are some trilobite species that have really, really small bodies and they're found all over the world and we suspect that they were planktonic, that they were swimming around up in the water column. And um, 
And one other piece of evidence to support that is that they had these huge eyes relative to their body size. And the surface of that was so curved they could actually see in 360 degrees, which would be really useful if you're swimming around up in the water column. And there's also trilobites that completely lose their eyes, right? And that's happened multiple like independent times. So trilobites that would maybe like live in deeper water, lost their eyes. And I guess there were some trilobites that I couldn't see, I guess. That's true. Not all trilobites had eyes. So we just got a question about where trilobites lived, if they were living entirely in the ocean or if they lived in other um, environments. Um, and so far we have only found them in um, deposits that represent uh, past ancient oceans. So as far as we know, they're completely marine. They did live in all different parts of the ocean. They lived in um, uh, near the equator, they lived near the poles, deep water, shallow water. Um, different types of environments in terms of like how much nutrient um, availability there was, stuff like that. They're the only exception to that general description that I just gave is uh, a few years ago, there was a study that reported some, some traces, some tracks that may have been made by trilobites in intertidal um, environments. So it is possible that trilobites were crawling a little bit up, up onto the beach, for example, um, in some parts of the world. But for the most part, they were living exclusively in the oceans. All right, we got a question, a very good question, asking where can we find trilobite fossils? And they're found in a specific kind of rock called sedimentary rock. So you might have heard like of igneous rock, that's volcanic rock. I've tried, when I was little, I tried looking for fossils in igneous rock and I would never find them, of course, because it's just all volcanic stuff. But they're, but look for sedimentary rock. That's rock like, they're called like shale, sandstone. And typically the, uh, you'd find fossils in rocks that were deposited uh, in a marine setting, right, Melanie? But do you know anywhere in New York City where maybe you could find fossils? Not in New, uh, there aren't many trilobites in New York City. There are trilobites in New York State. Um, mm -hmm. As you start going north and west, the rocks that are exposed, um, and normally you would see these like in outcrops and maybe along riverbeds, are marine and they're the right age for trilobites. They go from the Ordovician, which is you know roughly roughly about um, you know 450 million years ago to well actually there's some Cambrian stuff too. So more like 500 million years ago um, to uh, maybe about 300 million years ago. Um, those rocks are all represented in New York State and you can find trilobites in a lot of those different rocks because they're the right age and they represent um, an ancient ocean that used to, used to extend across part of the state. Um, but really what that means is that you can find trilobites anywhere in the world where the rocks were deposited in the ocean and at the right time, you know, when they were alive, which means that trilobites are found all over North America. They're found in um, South America, especially like Argentina and Bolivia. They're found in Australia. They're found in Antarctica. They're found in China. They're found in Russia. <laughs> um, a lot of different, oh, North Africa, a lot of different places in the world you can find trilobites. Oh, sure. Yeah, we just got a question um, asking us, what are we looking at? Are there any interesting stories? That's a great question. We've just been letting, we've just been letting the wonderful video of the trilobites wash over us as we talk about everything. Um, but yeah, so a lot of the fossils that we've been looking at um, over the past 15 minutes or so, including the ones we're looking at right now, are all from Western Utah. Um, they are about 500 million years old. Um, the really cool thing about this locality is that 
there are a couple of trilobite species, particularly one called Elrathia kingi, that is really, really abundant. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of specimens of this species have been found. And not only are there a lot of adult examples of the species, but there are a lot of juveniles too. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, from the fossil record, we can piece together changes um, that happened during development and how trilobites grew. This species is a great resource for asking those kinds of questions because there are so many specimens of so many different ages. Um, so we can actually calculate growth rates. We know how fast the, spe the species grew. We knew which parts were growing faster than others. We know when that changed during development. Um, but those sort of questions you can really only ask in a rigorous way if you have a lot of specimens. Um, and so that's what makes um, this material from Western Utah particularly uh, interesting for, for us um, uh, in terms of some of the scientific questions we're, we're interested in and are researching right now. Ooh, we just got like a pretty like sophisticated qu question about like population density with trilobites saying like how many specimens do you typically find in one little slab of rock? Usually it's just one commonly, but rarely it's when you find more, but it's this site, this site is special because of this, right? Specifically. It varies a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there you can find, um, you can find rocks that, yeah, where there's one specimen um, every, I don't know, in every square foot um, on, you know, the surface of a, on the surface of a rock, they can, they can also be almost overlapping one another. The hard part about asking questions about population density is that because when an animal dies and, or, or let's talk specifically with trilobites, when they shed their exoskeleton or they die, exoskeleton is just sitting there on the seafloor for a while before it gets buried. And so, and that, how fast fossils get buried can vary a lot. And so on any given bed, you can actually have specimens that represent a lot of different, like a, a lot of different time. Um, they might not all have been around at the same time. And so part of asking questions about like population density is really, really dependent on the, con like the rock context and how they were preserved. Occasionally, we get places where there's evidence for really fast burial. Like let's say there's a landslide, it buries everything that was right there. Then you can actually actually say something about a relative abundance of species, how, what, how many species were there, what was more abundant, what, the, what was less abundant, what might have been interacting with each other. Um, but you have to be really, really careful that you're interpreting those beds correctly in terms of how much time is represented. There's, a, there's also some rocks that are completely made out of little trilobite pieces, right? We commonly call it like hash. Yeah, that's true. Because also as this, as fossil or what might become fossil material is um, getting moved around on the ocean floor from currents and ripples, sometimes it accumulates into piles. You'll see this on the beach sometimes. You'll see accumulations <laughs> of shells in one place. And that doesn't mean that all of the organisms that used to live in those shells lived at the same time or interacted with one another, but the process of, um, process of uh, sedimentation and buildup of sedimentary rocks actually um, can move stuff around um, and, mm -hmm. and it can pile up in places um, and then you end up with rocks that are really, really dense with fossils. I also love the idea of like trilobite hash browns. That's hilarious. <laughs> So we just got a question about how long did an individual trilobite live? Like how long was its lifespan? I've this heard, one, go ahead. I, I've heard some horseshoe crabs could live to be like up to 20 years old, but that's, that's about all that I know about this, right? Yeah, basically what Ernesto's answer is reflecting is that we don't know. Um, and one of the ways, but one of the ways that we can get a, get a good guess is by looking at living arthropods. And so horseshoe crabs, because we know they lived in the same way, that's a pretty good candidate to, to at least to start looking at how long trilobites might have lived as well. 
Um, but there's a huge range. Some arthropods live for a year, some marine arthropods live for a year, some can live for their lobsters, which we think may have, li may, uh, have lived as long as like 70 or 80 years. Right. Um, there are some invertebrates, particularly clams and gastropods or, or sea snails, that incorporate information about the chemicals in the ocean as they grow. And so if you very, very carefully sample them and look at, um, look at that chemical composition, you can see seasonal changes and you can use that to count the number of years. Hmm. We don't have anything like that with trilobites. Although it doesn't mean we won't someday. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be like the big breakthrough. That'd be amazing. That'd be a huge breakthrough. Yeah. Ooh, cool. We just got a question about trilobite defense. How did trilobites defend themselves against predators? I think one of the most obvious ones are all these spiny trilobites. There's, there's trilobites that are completely covered in spines, and that would be a deterrent for something taking a bite out of it. What else? We just got a question about um, asking what the most widespread species is, um, and is there one that's particularly common? There are some species that um, well, there's sort of two answers to that question. And the reason I pause is because there's the question about how widespread a particular species was when it was alive. And there are some species that lived like all, like basically lived around the entire globe at tropical, um, near, near the equator in tropical environments. But because Continent, because the continents have moved over time, the position of any particular fossil is not the same as where it was in the world when it was alive. So there can be some species that are pretty common now in terms of like where you find them in different rocks, um, even, even occasionally on different continents, but that doesn't mean that they were widespread at the time. Oh, cool. So the next question is about fossil prep or fossil preparation. So we have somebody at the museum. We have Anna at the museum, who's the, the main invertebrate fossil prep person. I don't actually have much experience prepping fossils, but do you, Melanie? Yeah, so there are lots of different ways you can prep fossils, and it depends on, um, it depends a lot on what the material is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, um, uh, particularly the material that the fossil is preserved in. Um, so we have a very, very uh, common way of prepping fossils is just by the mechanical removal of the surrounding rock. And there are lots of different tools that you can use to do this, including just including very simple things like picks, um, but also including vibrating tools, like what you, you know, kind of like a dentist drill. Um, you can also use to remove uh, the rock um, that's covering the fossil. Um, there are also um, air abrasion machines, which spit out a very, very fine um, particulate that slowly, um, that very... The other very cool way that you can do fossil preparation of trilobites, and this Ernesto does have a lot of experience yes, with, I do. <laughs> with acid preparation. <laughs> Yes. Do you want to explain that, Ernesto? Oh, absolutely. So sometimes trilobites are found in rocks called limestone, and they're basically made out of cal calcium carbonate. And if you've ever done, if you've ever done like the little experiment where you make a volcano using baking soda and acid, that's essentially how I prepare that rock. So I put that rock in acetic acid or vinegar, and that rock slowly breaks down and leaves behind the trilobite fossil itself, which was replaced by another material that wouldn't be dissolved by the acid. And once that's done, I can hand pick them. And there's like little 3D baby trilobites that I could look at. So that's my preferred way of prepping the fossil. Yeah, it's one, it's one of those things where it's actually the process of fossilization, even though we don't have the original exoskeleton left, 
because it was replaced with a mineral that's resistant to acid, we can throw them into acid baths, dissolve away the surrounding rock, and we're just left with the little bits of fossils. And we can see really small things and we can see all sides of the specimens. It's a really, really uh, useful, useful tool for that type of preservation. Yeah, in that case, I'm glad the trilobite original material is gone and replaced by, it's actually replaced by silica. So like glass, basically. Yeah. The really delicate too. Okay, so we just, uh, we've, we're getting some questions about how trilobites went extinct. Um, trilobites lasted, were around for about 250 million years. Um, they actually managed to survive two mass extinctions, um, one during the end Ordovician um, and one during the Devonian. And both times a lot of species went extinct, but the whole group managed to survive. But then they went extinct, finally, the entire group at the end of the Permian during the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, which is probably, which is, for which there is like the best evidence, there's, there's more and more evidence um, every year that the reason that extinction, that that extinction is associated with really, really large volcanic eruptions that um, uh, threw a lot of like chemicals um, into the air and changed both the uh, composition of the air and the water and had major environmental stress uh, um, or resulted in major envi environmental stress on a lot of different organisms. Um, and that question actually is a really great segue um, to the video we're going to look at next. Um, and uh, because and because this, this video is all about extinction, um, there we go. <laughs> extinction is the end of a species, and millions of species have experienced extinction over time. In fact, probably 99.999% of all species that ever existed are no longer with us. Extinction is a way of life, actually, but there have been mass extinction events where a whole array of species get wiped out, and some biologists think the, the current rate of species loss is probably a thousand times what the normal rate is. I'm Michael Novacek. I'm the provost of science here at the museum, but I'm also a curator of paleontology. Well, the collections in the museum here and other museums are really a record of life. Very important for not only telling us what went extinct, but what survived. So what follows are six tales of extinction, organisms with something to tell us about the time we're living in now. My name is Melanie Hopkins, and I'm an assistant curator in invertebrate paleontology. Trilobites are a group of extinct marine arthropods. Arthropods include things like lobsters and insects. There are sort of two main types of trilobite larvae. One appears to have been completely benthic. Benthic just means crawling around on the ocean floor. And then there's another type of larvae, planktonic, swimming or floating up in the water. During the mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician, trilobite species with benthic larvae were more likely to survive. In some ways this is surprising because there are a lot of good things about having planktonic larvae. A big one being that it's much easier to disperse further and ultimately end up with a larger geographic range. This is a really good example of extinction selectivity. And what we mean by extinction selectivity is that during a major extinction event, there are some organisms that are more likely to go extinct because of some aspect of their ecology, like what they eat, or some other aspect of their lifestyle, like in the case of trilobites, whether they had planktonic larvae or benthic larvae. By studying extinction selectivity in the fossil record, we can begin to understand what sorts of characteristics make some organisms more vulnerable to certain types of environmental change. My name is Allison Bronson. I'm a PhD student studying fossil fishes at the museum's Richard Gilder Graduate School. Dunkleosteus was a placoderm. Placoderms are fishes with bony armor that covered most of their body. And it lived during the late Devonian from about 350 to 370 million years ago. Dunkleosteus is just cool because it's so big. Estimates have ranged up to 20 feet long. It was really one of the first examples of a big ocean-going predatory animal, occupying a role sort of similar to what we think of as a great white shark today. 
Dunkleosteus went extinct along with the rest of the placoderms at the Hangenberg event, which was a loss of almost 96% of vertebrate species at the end of the Devonian. Dunkleosteus wasn't the only large placoderm in the ocean at that time, but after this Hangenberg event, we only see smaller animals in the fossil record. And this is part of what we call the Lilliput effect. The Lilliput effect is something that we see at certain mass extinction events, where before the extinction, animals are generally very large, and after the extinction, animals are generally very small. We still don't really know what the explanations for this might have been, and there's probably more than one. My name is Aki Watanabe, and I'm a PhD student in the Richard Gilder Graduate Program here at the museum, and also in the Division of Paleontology. So 65 million years ago, we had a meteorite impact on this planet, which led to the extinction of non-bird dinosaurs. And we're all familiar with that. But less familiar is the late Triassic extinction event that led to the extinction of a lot of early crocodilian relatives. Early crocodilian relatives, we call this bigger group Pseudosuchians, which include modern-day crocs um, and their extinct relatives. They were actually really diverse in the Triassic. Like you have herbivorous atosaurs with armor plates. You have Rhodosuchians, which have big skulls, like what you see, for example, on T-Rex. And you also see bipedal forms like Ephigia. So at the end of the Triassic, Pseudosuchians are actually more diverse than dinosaurs. But for some reason, it's still unclear, a series of extinction events happened at the end of the Triassic that led to more of an extinction in major groups of Pseudosuchians. And then all these niches opened up that Pseudosuchians previously occupied. And so dinosaurs were able to move into these niches and diversify, and then thus the rest of the Mesozoic became the age of dinosaurs. I am Ross McPhee, I'm Curator of Mammals at the American Museum of Natural History. Horses are old in North America. They appeared roughly 50 million years ago, were very successful up until about 10,000 years ago when they disappeared in both North and South America along with other Ice Age creatures. But then 500 years ago, when the Europeans first came to these shores, they brought horses with them. And over time, horses escaped captivity and they're still with us today. We call them Mustangs in Western North America. But some people consider them invasive, and that's really probably wrong. The lineage that gave rise to the domestic horse that we see here, you can trace back into their antecedents in North America. And from my point of view, that makes horses a native species. Right now, we're perched on the cusp of being able to bring back extinct species, and people are talking about bringing back mammoths and saber-toothed cats, but we don't need to do that with horses. We have them right here, right now. If you want to think of a Pleistocene park populated by Ice Age creatures, there is really none more appropriate than the horse. I'm Sarah Ruan. I work at the American Museum of Natural History in the Department of Herpetology. Golden toads are one of the most charismatic and beautiful looking frogs that have ever been discovered. They were only discovered in the mid-1960s in the Monte Verde cloud forests of Costa Rica. And what's shocking is that 40 years later, by 2004, they were declared extinct. So we only knew about these toads for a very brief period of time before they were absolutely gone. While it's still sort of a mystery what happened to golden toads, these are one of the first animals where climate change was heavily implicated in their demise. And that's not entirely clear, but it's likely that it's a combination of reasons. Maybe temperatures got a little too warm for these toads, and something like chytrid fungus, which affects a lot of amphibians, could have then taken advantage and come in and decimated the populations. So one of the reasons collections are so important is that we can go back and look at animals that have been collected in the past, even up to 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and test for some of the pathogens or the problems that are decimating amphibian populations today. I'm Mark Siddall, Curator of Invertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History. The guinea worm is a nematode parasite of humans and can grow to be about a meter in length inside of the infected person's tissues. Infection with guinea worm is rarely fatal, but its effect does lead to malnutrition and starvation and other problems because when you have a meter long worm coming out of your knee with excruciating pain. You can't take care of your family. You can't go to school. Driving human parasites to extinction is a moral obligation. The guinea worm has caused millions of people to suffer over hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, it wouldn't exist if there wasn't a human to be its host. Even as we drive human parasites to extinction, it's really important to hold on to specimens in collections like ours, especially 
in our frozen tissue collection because we want to preserve the genetic legacy of those parasites that we might better understand other parasites we're trying to drive to extinction. All right, we hope you enjoyed that video and we have a last, last couple few questions to ask. Uh, somebody asked about the type of rock, which I mentioned before. So I did talk about sandstones, shales, and limestones, but they asked uh, what these types of rock may be indicative of um, restrictions and environment in terms of some species. And what I know is that um, sandstone typically means that those rocks were deposited in shallower water you could say because um, they have like larger grain size. Shale, because they're more muddy, or pro probably deposited in deeper water. So these species probably lived in deeper water. And limestone, I think that's typical also of like very deep water, even deeper than, than, than shales actually. So in terms, in terms of like ecological restrictions, I think maybe that answers that. So for our last question, Melanie. Um, we also have a question about why should we talk and think about trilobites today? This is a great question because, you know, trilobites are extinct. They were around hundreds of millions of years ago. Why should we care anymore? And I would say that because trilobites have such a great fossil record, because they lived in so many different environments and they lived through so many different environmental changes, by studying them, we can learn a lot about how animals survive, for example, mass extinctions, how they respond to environmental change, what kinds of changes result in diversification, what kinds of changes result in the occurrence, of, like the occurrence or appearance of new species. And, um, and on top of that, trilobites also tell us explicitly or tell us specifically about the early evolution of animals because they're one of the first animals to show up in the fossil record in large numbers. Um, so there are lots of different evolutionary biology and earth history questions that we can answer using trilobites. And I would say that that's a great reason to study them, even though they're not alive anymore today. All right. Thank you so much for joining us and for the amazing questions. I hope you enjoyed it. So the museum is doing broadcasts every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And next Friday, July 31st, our colleagues in vertebrate paleontology will be talking about pterosaurs. So please subscribe to this channel for more great live streams and science videos and have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us.